It's my absolute pleasure now um, to introduce a video by Zane Vergy. Um, she is an incredibly respected and recognized journalist with an action-packed background and experience as a storyteller, entrepreneur, communicator, and interviewer. She's well known as a former CNN anchor and correspondent and has made a successful transition into the world of communications and creative entrepreneurship. Her most recent project is a data and information site dedicated to Africa in partnership with MasterCard Foundation. Her communications firm, Zane Vergy Group, has worked with a large number of organizations and entities such as Bloomberg Media, Bloomberg Philanthropies, Equity Group Foundation of Kenya, World Health Organization, the Aga Khan Development Network, and the United Nations Economic Commission for Africa. She is a very sought after facilitator um, and interviewer and has spoken on platforms such as TED and Africa House. She's a senior fellow at the Center for Strategic and International Studies Africa program. And she's a guest opinion columnist on African issues for the national UAE. Um, she's also a startup founder and content creator co-founding Acoma Media, which is a continental network of workspaces for Africa's creative and cultural economy in 2015. And there are many other ventures that she's done as well. Um, she lives, I believe, in Los Angeles and in um, Nairobi in Kenya. And she's very kindly put together a video which um, we'll be sharing now for all the delegates. Hello, everyone. It is a pleasure to be with you here today. My name is Zane Vergy. I hope you and your families are keeping safe and healthy and that you are able to cope and navigate these turbulent times. I've spent my entire career in communications and today I'd like to take you through my personal journey and reflect at each point how the communications landscape shifted and how it will keep shifting. Before joining CNN, when I was 25 years old, I started on-air life as a radio DJ in Nairobi. Lots of fun. I hosted The Love Show and played music and offered bad romantic advice. After joining a local TV station called Kenya Television Network, I came to truly understand the power of being on the air and the importance of having a singular, crisp and clear message one that connected to people. I enjoyed having a large audience at the time because there was very limited TV competition and no social media. <laughs> I wasn't competing with Twitter, Facebook, or Instagram. A global journalism career began when I moved to Atlanta to work for CNN. I covered some major stories from the anchor desk and I learned many things that stories are decided through newsworthiness, yes, but also through pictures, characters, and uniqueness, and that a connection and an emotion must be delivered. I learned too that less words are more. I learned to truly listen. And I also discovered that press releases are not ever really read. The buzz of a newsroom and breaking news was very exciting and I truly immersed myself in stories of the day. Many years later, I transferred to being a field reporter when I covered US foreign policy from the State Department in Washington, DC. That was when Condoleezza Rice was the Secretary of State. I traveled the world in her plane with my producer here, Elise Labatt. It was an amazing experience. Secretary Rice's press corps, by the way, was almost entirely female, and we called ourselves the Diplo Babes. I reported daily on Wolf Blitzer's show called The Situation Room, analyzing and reporting the foreign policy news of that day. I learned so much about beat reporting and how sources are managed and developed and ultimately used to break or to confirm news. I saw firsthand how the daily briefing at the State Department in Washington could actually resonate around the world. I observed how pitches coming into my inbox would generate editorial interest if they had a news hook. Health Beats operated in similar ways and were actually much more siloed because they're considered feature stories that occasionally make the news cycle. At the time, health, was not a national security issue. It's very different right now. 
From Washington, I moved to London and I hosted the Europe morning shows, which was exciting. I met the queen and I also hosted many shows from Africa. And it was here I discovered that there were so many important stories that needed to be told on the continent and no international media was really doing it well, or if they were doing it, it was kind of stereotypical. And I felt that Africa had more edge, more nuance, more dynamism, and that was not being reflected. And I wanted to do something about it. So I left CNN and I built a media startup called Akoma with my co-founder, Chidi Afulezi. It was a digital platform where Africans could come and tell authentic and compelling stories that truly reflected the diversity and the richness of the continent. One of our big successes was Amplify, a creative content and talent accelerator where creatives from various countries came together in cohorts to learn and to collaborate on stories. A coma unfortunately failed. You know, doing business in Africa is pretty tough. I discovered there are 54 countries, a multitude of languages, uh, various media ecosystems that add a, a real level of complexity that is actually quite challenging. But from a communication standpoint, I learned the following from my Acoma experiences, and I'd really love to share those with you. First of all, the most important person in Africa is the storyteller. The most important person on any continent is the storyteller because it's the young talent that have the smartphones and that are crazy creative and they need to be used. They're not used enough. I also discovered that local content creation is a lot cheaper and a lot more authentic and that coupled with training can improve the quality of content and local messaging that you need. The creative and cultural industries essentially can project soft power of the continent if they're deployed correctly. And there remains much work to be done in this space, in the CCIs as they're known, in order to make them more effective. After a coma, I created Zane Vergy Group. We're a global media advisory firm specializing in emerging markets. And I work with countries and corporates and foundations, as well as creatives, to put on some pretty cool events, such as Rouse and Fearless Women. One of my early projects was to take a detailed look at global health communications. Dr. Tedros, at the time, had just taken over as Director General of the World Health Organization. And I spent some time looking at the nitty gritty of health communications at the very highest levels in Geneva. And it was clear that tech platforms, data analysis, um, distilling information into understandable formats for different audiences was absolutely crucial. And there was a lot of work being done around this space, which has proven very helpful now because then COVID hit. And global health was no longer a siloed issue. It was a global security issue, an economic and a social priority as well. So what communications lessons did I learn over the last few months from observing what was going on around us? First of all, Clear and efficient messaging was critical. Wear a mask, wash your hands, get tested, stay six feet apart. The simpler the communications, the better. No technical jargon, no politics. Sitting here in the United States, I can tell you firsthand what politics does to messaging. Transparency was important. Say what you know, say what you don't know. It's okay, build trust with the audience. Of course, storytelling. Where there were individual opportunities to tell stories, be they of triumph, of sorrow, of recovery, whether they were cautionary stories, stories of impact, of breakthrough, of communities rallying around one another, all of these resonated. It made the COVID pandemic real. Remember how Tom Hanks and his wife uh, reported very early on that they had COVID? The message there was, if those celebrities have it, then perhaps I am vulnerable. Perhaps I can get it too. Remember the stories, for example, in Italy and all those performances of music and, and opera on balconies. Look at how the NBA and the football leagues have actually 
employed and leveraged science and ensured experts helped them navigate this turbulent environment safely. One of the greatest communications challenges, I have to point out, and you know, has been how to deal with the infodemic, how to deal with fake news and incorrect facts and information. One of the ways that has worked really well uh, has been through health entertainment. And really consider what's happened here. When you look at things like memes or animations or videos, they have had a significant impact and have gained a lot more prominence. When you use content creators, this has proved in this pandemic a powerful tool because creativity is key in engaging people. When you've got clever memes or entertaining videos that communicate key messages and address the stigma, the fear, and the paranoia, it reaches people, right? There were many videos that were instructional that I saw that were funny and quirky and clever in sound and design, but they got the message across and that is what we need to do. Data and dashboards were something else to take note of. They were an immediate communications need. And I want to highlight one person that did an incredible job. A 17 year old kid, He's a coder. His name is Avi Schiffman. He became one of the key providers of information on COVID-19 very early on. He stepped up and he delivered right away on what people were looking for. He created this dashboard using a very simple web scraping tool, which, and by the way, he originally built it to track sports stats at his high school. <laughs> and he applied that at the beginning of the pandemic to aggregate data from various national health agency sites. This is what technology helped to do. Avi became the center of gravity in the United States, and this was his site. From my work in Africa, Julie Gishuru reached out to me. She's the head of communications with the MasterCard Foundation. And back in March, we had a conversation and we discussed the vision that she had behind building a digital platform that would capture the stats and information, the numbers, some analysis that really told the COVID story in Africa. And she requested that we explore the development of our own dedicated dashboard for COVID-19 data and information and stories dedicated to Africa. And that's what we did. This is covidhqafrica.com. Please go check it out. The goal was to generate a platform like this that was high end and that showed Africa's design and product prowess and made sure that the information was presented in a delightful and useful way to the African community and reflected their continent back to them. This was the dashboard. My business partner, Chidi, is actually, unfortunately for me, one of the best product guys out there. And together we built this website. And we, it also demonstrated to us that the WHO relationships that I had in the past came into play because we were able to use their data and receive their encouragement and support for an initiative like this. Our development partners also came up with useful bots and data visualizations like this and more that we've got in the pipeline that have really resonated. In our work on the continent, what we want to do at the same time is to leverage the individual creator, like I've been saying, to share messages online and on mobile. Watch this. The Up To Us campaign is running uh, continent wide and this was a video in Ghana. So this is part of a hyper-local content strategy that we're building that truly leans on creators to communicate messages that are identifiable, that resonate in their communities, in their countries, and their own languages. The old school works too. <laughs> it doesn't always have to be high tech, okay? We've used local messaging on popular motorbikes in Kenya called Bora Bodas, like this. As you can see, we have a jacket there, wear a mask, has the website there. And uh, 
people go around motorbikes uh, across Nairobi and, and other parts of the continent with messages like this. Billboards work as well. Right. So it's important to look at things like radio messages that have been very effective in local language campaigns that we've done. We've also worked with an intelligence driven company that created a dashboard for the United Nations Economic Commission for Africa, as well as Africa CDC, that really informed us on conversations that people were having on social media about things like COVID, infection, symptoms, food prices, domestic violence. We took these keywords and we were able to map key themes and gain some pretty valuable insights into what people were saying in the cities and towns that they lived in. And we were able to prioritize information. I hope sharing my stories and experiences has been helpful to you today. As we move through the pandemic and we look beyond it, it's absolutely clear that communications is no longer a soft aspect of executing on big projects. It's critical, it's central. We now see the development of health apps where Apple and Google, for instance, are inserting themselves into health communications. WHO and CDC are doing some very smart integrations that give them immediate access to health information and analysis. We have to keep finding more ways, be more innovative in how we put out positive messages from trusted sources. We need to train more journalists on things like vaccines or gender issues, for example. And we have to make people more vigilant about what it is they are reading, what it is they are learning and absorbing. Diseases are now being considered a global security issue something very different today. Risks of pandemics are higher now than a nuclear war. So it's imperative that countries, organizations, and individuals put time and energy into truly embracing health communications. And importantly, in investing in bold new ways to do messaging. Thank you. Um, all that really remains for us to say is um, a huge thank you to all of our speakers and to all of you today for joining us on this um, rainy Sunday afternoon. In a time where health is at the forefront of people's mind, today has provided the perfect platform for us to explore and discuss what the future of healthcare holds and how this can and will impact on us as individuals. There is no doubt that coronavirus remains at the forefront of everybody's minds, but for me, there are a few areas of healthcare which I am particularly excited about. As was mentioned earlier, with the growth of wearable technology and remote monitoring, there will be greater emphasis on gathering and analyzing large amounts of data. This will support more personalized medicine where treatment can be individually tailored to the patient. Nanotechnology, which I'm not sure was discussed, was an, is another area that is particularly exciting. Um, nanoscience is a relatively new field um, that studies materials at the nanoscale. Um, and it has the potential to tra transform current chemo chemotherapy treatments um, with nanostructures being loaded with chemotherapy drugs to selectively target cancer cells, um, which would give the benefit of chemotherapy without any of the side effects. And I hope that you're as excited as I am about what the future of healthcare holds for us all. So thank you all very much for joining.